was standing here a few days ago in the middle of nothing, I realized something, that without the people of Freedom Church, this is all that we would have. A place with so much potential, but with very little to offer to the people of Berkeley County. And yet, as I gaze just a few hundred feet, I'm able to see another story, a story of people's sacrifice, a story of generosity. As I walk through what will soon be a brand new paved parking lot, I'm able to envision the thousands of people that will take their first step right here towards all that God has for them. As I see the sight of a future building, I hear the laughter of thousands of children who will soon be in this building, learning about Jesus. I hear children that will be baptized here, give their lives to Jesus here. Maybe some who will even enter ministry here because of this building that will be built. As I walk into this building, I'm reminded of the thousands of lives that have been changed the marriages that have been healed, how addictions chains have been broken. And I'm reminded that it's because of the generosity and the sacrifice of so many people who have come that we are able to say, welcome home. We are that church. We are that church that will do anything short of sin to be able to see people find freedom in Christ, that will see addictions, chains dropped. And, and it is just amazing to me that the surface has just begun to be scratched of all that God wants to do in Berkeley County because of you. Because of you. And he wants to work through you. He wants to do things in your life. And most of all, he wants to work through you to see other people that are far from God, but they're close to you to find freedom in Christ. And so we've been looking at this whole series. Yeah, come on, give it up. That's good. We've been looking over this whole series at what, what does that mean then? And we've looked at how we are as a church and who we are as a church and, and how we are to operate as a church and the why behind why we do what we do. And that people far from God and seeing them that they would find freedom in Christ, and that that is our number one priority. And so we are thinking often about the people who aren't here yet. That's why we're building more space, because right now we're having four services and four experiences, and we're putting as many people as we can in those experiences and trying to talk more people like you into coming at 8 a.m. By the way, thank you so much for coming at 8 a.m. I know this morning when you got up and looked out and the clouds were covering and it was dark outside still and there was a misty rain coming in, that's called nap weather is what that's called. That's called sleep-in weather, but y'all decided to make a difference, and so you're doing that. And so we're having four experiences, and we're, 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 having, we're try asking people to come at 1230 in the afternoon like a couple hundred people do every single weekend. And we're, and we're back in children's area making room for kids. And sometimes there's so many kids in rooms and people are doing the best they can and they're teaching them about Jesus. And it's incredible. But soon, because of your generosity and because of your sacrifice, we'll have a whole building that's just dedicated to kids. It's going to be incredible. We'll have a little bit more hallway space for you to gather in, and we'll be able to take this wall that I'm pointing at right here, knock it down, and have about 900 seats in this auditorium. Why? Because we're not willing to stop at what we are right now and who we've been able to reach right now, because we believe the people who aren't here yet, who will fill those seats, the kids who are not back in kids' area yet, who will fill those rooms that we're going to build up are who we are concerned about and worrying about. We've seen over the last couple of weeks that worship, demonstrative, creative worship that includes the arts is a value to us and it's who we are as a church. And then we saw last weekend that we know from the very nature of God that meeting in community with groups of other people and, and who are following Jesus as well and then a few who aren't and always inviting in a, a seat, leaving a seat open for someone who's not following him yet. 
um, is, is so important to our lives. And it's the Jesus way of how we do our lives, to gather in groups. And so we do that, the care and the encouragement through small groups at Freedom Church. And we talked about the importance of that. So as we wrap up this series, why we church, and by the way, can I just tell you, we're starting a brand new series next weekend. And you want to invite some people to this series. We've been talking about why and who we are as a church. This has been a family series. We did it in the fall to kind of bring the family in and to teach us who we are as a church next weekend. I'm just telling you, can we live this out a little bit next weekend? Do you believe that people that are far from God but are close to you are important to him and are important to this church? Next weekend, invite them. We're starting a brand new series called Duct Tape Stairs and Destiny Filled Stars. You try to figure out what that one's about and I'll... I'll give you some props, all right? But you need to invite your friends. It's going to be a great series. But we're wrapping up this series, Why We Church. And, and I want us to look at one of the most important values that we have as a church. It's been a value that we have installed and instilled in our church since the very beginning of our church. And that is the value of generosity. We are a generous church. We're a generous church. We've been asking questions. So here's the question for this weekend um, that I believe is one that's worth asking, and if it's worth asking, it's worth answering. And here's the question. Why do we as a church unapologetically ask for the people of freedom to give generously of their time, their talent, and their treasure? You might say it like this. It feels like I'm always being asked to serve somewhere like, or give towards a project financially, or put my talent to use in some area, it feels like the church wants to use me. That's what it feels like, you might would say. Or you might would say, I don't like it when the church talks about money. Just leave politics and money out of the church. Just don't talk about it. It makes me nervous. And I don't think the church should, should discuss people's money. I don't think you should discuss giving money. I don't think you should ask for money. Just, just let what happens happen. I just don't like discussing that, you might would say. Or you might would say, I work hard all week long to use my talent. And I use my talent to, to make an income. And I'm good at what I do. But I just want to come to church and have some me time. Calgon, take me away. Like, just want to have some time for me. I just want to consume some content. I'm not looking to contribute. I'm just looking to consume. I just need some, some, I need to learn some more. I need to grow some more. That's all I want to do. And yet, you asked me to carry the load of serving this church and to serve in ways that are uncomfortable for me. And he want me to use my talent. I used it all week. Why do you want me to use it even more at church? And all of this series, we've been kind of going to the easy answer first and then discussing it some more. But here's the easy answer for why we would ask you to generously give of your time, your talent, and treasure. Why we would unapologetically talk about money. Why we would unapologetically ask you to give your talent to God first and to your income second. Why, why we would say give your best, give your best to God. Why we would do that. It's because God modeled generosity and Jesus talked about generosity and money more than any other subject in the Bible. Did you know that? Jesus talked about money more than he did heaven and hell combined. Is that surprising to you? Like, is that surprising? It was to me the first time I ever figured that out when I read through and saw what Jesus talked about. He talked about money more than any other subject except for the kingdom of God. He talked about the kingdom of God a lot. Now we should usher the kingdom of God here. And 11 out of 39 parables talk directly about money, generosity. One out of every seven verses, one in seven in the gospel of Luke talks about finances, generosity. Here's why. Because Jesus knew something about us because he was there when we were made. He was present at the creation of man. He was present at the creation of the world. And he knew this about our very souls he knew this about the way that we work. He knew how we work. And he knew and he said in Matthew 6, 21, your treasure, for where your treasure is, rather, there your heart will be also. Jesus knew that our heart often follows our treasures. And some of us have treasure, all of us have treasure that is monetary treasure. 
Some of us, all of us rather, have treasure that is talent. And all of us have treasure that we've got that is our time. In fact, one of the most valuable assets that we have is our time. Our time, our talent, and our financial treasure. It's the treasure that God gives us. And Jesus said, where you put your treasure, your heart will follow. I've always noticed the paradox of that. He could have said, where your heart is, your treasure will follow. So get your heart right. Make sure your heart's good. Make sure your heart's in the right place. Because then, then your time, your talent, and your treasure will follow your heart. So get your heart right. But he didn't say that. He, he did say guard your heart. Don't let anything else affect it. And then he said, where you put your treasure, your time, your talent, your financial treasure, where you put that, your heart will follow. And so as a church, what we decided is we wanted to put our time, our talent, and our treasure into the right place and towards the right thing because we knew that our heart as a church would follow that. And it allows people like Pastor Jeff and Melanie who have come to say this is a special place because where your heart is is where your treasure was and where you put your treasure. Isn't that amazing? Jesus also challenged us to give up our way. I think that really is what it boils down to. Don't, don't miss this. This is a small part of the sermon, but it's so important that you catch it. The, what Jesus was really, Jesus wasn't really that concerned about our time. He has an abundance of time. He has all of eternity. He wasn't really that concerned about our talent. He created us. He made us with that talent, but he, he wasn't that concerned about our talent. He could usher up any talent in anybody that he needed or wanted. He, he, he can create anything he needs. He doesn't need our talent. He wasn't really that concerned about our treasure. He owns all the cattle on all the hills. He created the very treasure that we have. Anything that he needs, he, he gets, he wants. Anything that God desires, it's his. It's already his. But what he wanted to do in us is to cultivate an ability in us to give up our way, our plans. And how do we carry out our plans? We carry out our plans with our time, our talent treasure. In fact, you show me your checkbook register if you still have one, or your Venmo account for others of you, and I'll show you what you love. You show me your calendar, you show me my calendar, I'll show you what I love. How much time do I spend with God? How much time do I serve? You, you, you show me where I put my talent, that thing that God has given me, uniquely gave to me, and said, I want you to, use, do I use it just to make an income? Is that all I do? And then go, man, I'm tired of doing that. I don't want to do that on the weekend. Come on, give me a break. I know I'm specially trained with a master's degree in teaching and dealing with children, but don't make me do that for God. I know that he got me that scholarship to get that master's degree. I know that he's given me the opportunity to be trained for 40 years in teaching, but don't make me do that. I know that I'm, I've got the gift of just loving on people and caring for people, and I do that, for, for, and I'm a counselor for a living, or I'm a counselor at a school or whatever, but don't make, me, don't make me care for people in the context of small groups. I do that all week long. Just, just let me do something. I'll, I'll do something else. I'll do something else. And so we have our own way. We have our own plans. We have a way that we want to do things, and God says, I want to break that up. Look what he says in Luke 9.23. Then he says to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Just give up your own way. Take up your cross daily. It indicates that we're going to have to give up our way daily. You're not going to do it just one time. Oh, yeah, I gave it all to God. 1964. It's all good. No, no, every day. Every day. Daily and follow me. In fact, if you look at these two scriptures put together, there's a huge teaching, and it goes like this. Listen to me. Don't follow your heart. Let your heart follow your generosity. Have you ever heard people say that? I just want to follow my heart. Please don't. Please don't follow your heart. Please don't do it. Don't follow it. Let your heart follow your generosity. Let your heart, Jesus said, I, I need you to understand that your heart is, is, is evil and desires evil things. And I want to replace that with the, the heart, my heartbeat, I want to place that with who I am. And in order to do that, you're going to have to give up your way. In order to give up your way, I'm going to give you time. I'm going to give you talent. And I'm going to give you treasure with the sole purpose to see if you will give it back. 
if you'll give it back. Why do you think you got all that you have? You see, if you'll give it back, we give up your way. We give up your way. So the first reason that we give for time, our talent, our treasure is a spiritual reason. In fact, I'll tell you this. Generosity is the quickest accelerant to a completely surrendered life. If you want to be completely surrendered, that should be all of our goals if we follow after Jesus. Generosity is the quickest accelerant to that. When you give of your time, your talent, your treasure, you have taken a huge step towards a fully surrendered life. In fact, what we see, just statistically speaking, is people who give of their time, their talent, and their treasure, they also begin to surrender their way. And you start to see them take huge steps in their spiritual life. But also, there's a very practical reason. Because I think you, you want to know the why. Right? We talked about the why of our church. But you also need to know the how. And you need to see how the why drives the how. And you want someone who, who will shoot straight with you. So I can just stick to the spiritual. You, you need to obey God. He wants to change you. He wants to take your way. But there's a very practical reason that God would have us to give of our time, our talent, and our treasure. And here is what the practical reason is. Because it costs to be that church. It costs. It costs time. It costs talent. And it costs treasure. We can't be the church that God has called us to be now listen to this. It's the first time you're going to hear this today probably. Nobody else has told you this yet today. We can't be the church that God has called us to be without you. You are special. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you're so special. You're so special. We, turn to your other neighbor and tell him, we need you too. I know I picked you second, but we need you too. See, God created in such a way that he decided that he would use us. I said earlier that some of you might say, oh, it just feels like the church wants to use me. God wants to use me. What an honor to be used by God. What an absolute honor for God to have created the world and not need us. He doesn't need us, but he decided to choose us, and to use us. That's incredible. And so what's before us then is that God has given us this time, he's given us this talent, he's given us this treasure, and we have to decide, will we be used by God? Because now, in the way that God has set it up, I'll use the word need, please understand that I don't think that God needs us. Okay, I want to teach you, but I, the only word in the English language that I can think of to use here is need, because in the context of what we're talking about now, the way that God has put it into motion, your time is needed. Your treasure is needed. Your talent is needed. In fact, we can't be the church that God has called us to be without you. Without you. The unique gifting that God has given you. God has gifted you with a talent, and he's given you time, and he's blessed you with treasure that is needed. And so what I'm saying is, you are important to the kingdom of God. That is a sobering thought. Like there's a plan that God has in Berkeley County, and for such a time as this, he saw to it that you were here, and he planted a church a little over eight years ago called Freedom Church, which he allows Connie and I to lead, which we are honored and amazed by. And he called you to be here for such a time as this because he has a very specific role for you. For you. You are not a spectator. You, you are not a consumer of content. Yeah, it worries me in the world that we live in. You can consume some of the greatest content in the entire world at the, just at the, your fingertip. You can listen to the best preachers in the world. You can listen to podcasts. You can watch online. You can consume content. And we could consume content in a way that we convince ourselves that we are actually a part of something when all we are doing is sitting and spectating something else that's going on. And God has called you to be a unique part of his plan. He's called you to do something incredibly important. Can I teach you how this works just a little bit with an illustration? Zach, where's Zach at? Zach, if you'll come up here just for a minute. Y'all know Zach? Yeah. 
So Zach is going to help me illustrate something. Let me show you the difference that can be made in your life. So, so there is a time when you have talent, right? You have talent. Everybody in here has talent. Zach has a talent. You have a talent too. Be like Zach. All right? You have a talent. But we all have a talent. Your talent can make you money. Your talent can do all kinds of things. We also have something that, that I would call um, this, this anointing in our lives, and it comes out of obedience and authority. So when we obey God, we obey God, we get under his umbrella of protection. We're protected. We have this anointing. And so obedience and, and, then, and then we're protected by it and, and authority. So God has an authority. Remember we've talked about this. God has a way. I know you have a way too and sometimes you think your way is a better way. But you don't have a universe. Remember all that. So he's got authority. has authority. And then we obey him, and when we obey him, we get under his authority. And we do that. Now listen, this is, this is contrary to what so many people think in this world today. We do that as well when we get under the authority of a spiritual house. So, so we have a church. And listen, there are dozens of amazing, incredible churches in this area. Amazing. Pick one. Right? And you get under that church and under that authority, under that pastor, and you are, under, and you, and you ha- are protected because it's obedience and it's authority. All right? And then you, so you have this story. And when all of a sudden you take your talent and you get under God's authority with obedience, now all of a sudden you have something that is called an anointing. It's an anointing. People have talent, and that's great. But it can only go so far. But when you get under God's authority, you're anointing. And here's how it happens. So you take your time. Without God, it's just time. You just got a talent. You can do things with your time. Time. What is time? Time is what? It's just ticking of a clock. It's just going away. Everybody, everybody's got it. But then you put, and all of a sudden, I have an anointing. I have an anointing. Right? You have, you have your talent. We've already talked about it. You have your treasure. It's just money. It's just money. It can do evil things. It can do good things. There's no evil money or, or good money. Money's just money, right? It's what you do with it. You put it under God's authority, and all of a sudden, it's an anointing. It's an anointing, right? And you begin to live out with that. That money can be multiplied. It can do incredible things. So, so it's like all of a sudden, your life can look like this a lot. You go, man, that person's got so much talent, right? He's got talent. Oh, no, no. He's under God's call. Now he's anointed, He's anointed. And, we, and so we can walk, and all of a sudden we're out of God's protection, and we're all going to go through storms. We're all going to go through crud in our lives. We're all going to go through all kinds of things. But it's amazing what can happen when you have an anointing. So now, here's what I want to show you that I want you to be. And what you need to be, we're using that word need gracefully, what you need to be for God and his church is the anointed version of you. All right? You have talent. You have time, you have treasure. Will you be obedient to God and will you be under his authority and under the authority of a local house so that that can be used by God? Give Zach a hand for helping me out. So it's an anointing. Now here's, here's what we're asking, I'm asking for you. I'm asking that the anointed version of you be a part of what God is wanting to do. That's easy to remember, and I just made it up. The anointed version of you be a part of what God is wanting to do. Now, how do, how do we do that? How do we do that? We live under his authority and under his protection. So we need the anointed version of you. So let's talk about each one of these pieces and parts. We've got time. We've got tre- talent. And we've got treasure. And when we generously give these and return these back to God, it's really what it is. We say give because we don't, again, English language, how do you do it? It's really not giving, right? Right? It's, really not, it's returning. It's already, it's already God's. He loaned it to you. He, he loaned you your time. He loaned you your talent. He loaned you your treasure. And, and we return to him, return to him what is already his. God, I'll give you some of this talent you so blessed me with. I can make an income with it too. It's incredible that I can do that, but I'm going to give it back to you as well. But let's talk about every single one of these. So first one is time. 
You know what's crazy about time is we all get the same amount. But everybody gets exactly the same amount of time. It's incredible. We, we're blessed with everybody gets same that You can't do anything to get more of it. You can't roll it over like the old cell phone plans. Like you, you can't go, hey, can, I didn't use my time yesterday. Can I get it? No, every day it's gone and you get a fresh new batch of time. But everybody gets the same amount every single day. And all we are given is the ability to, will we steward it or not? And in Matthew 25, there's this parable. I love this parable. It's one of my favorite parables in all of scripture. And it talks about that there is, there are these coins that are given to these people. And, and I want to see how Jesus illustrates this with this. And he has these, these, these picture of these coins that are given to these people and how they, there's a big word that steward it. Because that's what we decide is how do we, it's not ours, it's not our time, it's not our talent, it's not our treasure, it's God's. God has given it to us to steward. And what's, what's the role, what's the definition of steward? It's just the job of supervising or taking care of something. So God said, I, I'm going to give you this money. I'm going to give you this talent. I'm going to give you this time. And I want you to steward it for me. I want you to take care of it. I want you to multiply it. I want, you to, I want you to see it do, carry out the vision that I have for this world. And we, we've seen that God gave us time, he gave us talent, and he gives us treasures, and we're to steward it. And how does Jesus teach us to do that? Let's look at Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. Listen. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven, there's Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven while he's talking about money. See how he did that? Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants. And he entrusted his money to them. And while he was gone, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. I want to illustrate this for you. I've got some people that are going to help me. Y'all come up on stage real quick. And, and, and I've got Simone coming. I've got Stephen coming. I've got Alan coming. I think Stephen's got one bag. So you go over there with your one bag self, and then got Simone here, he's got two, and then Alan's coming up, Alan's one of our drummers, y'all see him, Alan back there, you can't see him behind the cage, he does an incredible job <laughs> drumming, they're gonna help me out, Alan's got five, so he's, he gives one, back. now here's the thing, we all get time, so everybody go and get some time, and we all get the same amount of time, so everybody just come in, y'all get some time, get some time, everybody gets the same amount of time, you just get as much time as everybody else gets, nobody gets any more, you can't get more, but you can't buy more, but it doesn't matter how much money you have, you can't get more time, so you got an amount of time, everyone gets it, but I want to show you something about time, we get to decide how we will steward that time, did you hear that? The question should never be like, do I have the time? Of course you have the time. You have the same amount of time everybody else has. The question is, how will you use your time? How will you steward it? And so let me, let me just show you, because I like to think real practical. Does everybody, is everybody else like practical? Like if you just tell me, use your time for God, thou will be blessed. I'm like, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? What do you want me to do? So let me, let me just walk you through something. What if you... Gave a tithe of your time. What's a tithe? 10%. That's what the word tithe means when you hear people say, we're taking our tithes and offering. It just means 10%. God just set this up in the Bible. So what if you gave a tithe of your time? And let's just be really fair. You should sleep eight hours. I know some of you are like, I don't need eight hours. I operate on four. You operate poorly on four. You need eight hours. All right? You're a cranky, cranky person on four. You need more. But we sleep eight hours. And then let's say... We work eight hours. And I know many of you are like, I wish I worked 60 hours last week. I wish I could work eight hours a day. You should work eight hours a day. Figure your life out. Work eight hours a day. All right. So we got sleep eight hours, work eight hours. That leaves in every single day eight hours. So we're being really, really kind to ourselves. We're just pushing away the work and we're pushing away the sleep. That leaves eight hours. 10% of eight hours that is left in our day would be 48 minutes a day to God. How does that sound? 48 minutes a day to God. Now, let's be even more fair. Let's be even more fair. And let's give 30 minutes a day to pray and to get to know him. Now, I'm not even sure that we should 
consider that giving that back to God. He really is giving us during that time. But again, let's be very, very practical. Let's be very, very kind in what, what we do. So we are going to give 30 minutes a day away. That leaves 18 minutes a day. Two hours, 16 minutes a week. So if you serve one hour every week, sit one experience, serve one experience. If you then, and that's in the church, if you didn't serve one hour outside the church every single week, so you come up to the church and you help with some stuff, or maybe you come and help at Freedom Youth, what if you do that? What if you come and you celebrate recovery, families, uh, count, that was what it was, Paul, I was looking for, families count, because they count, and then so, what if you come and serve outside, that's all, all outside, so you serve outside, of the church, one hour a week, and then what if once a month you showed up to car care or adopt a block, or you, you volunteered in a different area that we've got, and we did a missions project to help that once a month, you would still only use two hours and 16 minutes, leaving you, or you wouldn't even use the full two, hour, two hours and 16 minutes, you'd actually leave four minutes after that because God is so good, and he would give you four minutes just to sit and eat a Krispy Kreme. And so that would be, you, know, you could just chill for just a minute. So if you just gave, do you see how God's way really works? Like 10%, that's all, 10% of not even like the full day. I'm just talking about 10% of like take off sleep, take off work. You could serve a week, one hour a week. You could serve outside. You could serve once a month. That would be amazing. And if we all did that, lived a 216 life, 216, what if we just all said, said what, let me ask you it this way. What if everybody served the way you're currently serving? What would this church look like? But what if everybody served a 216 life? It also happens to be, and I love this, Philippians 216. Listen, hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that, listen, my work was not useless. Use your life in a way, 216 way, that you can say my work was not useless. My life was not useless. When we give of our time, that's what God does. All right, let's talk about our talent. Our talent. So we need to give of our talent. Everyone has a talent and a spiritual gifting. But look, these come in different proportions. Look at what the scripture says. It says, dividing it in proportion. And so I want you to come and get some talent. But Stephen, you don't get very much. You, don't have, you do have a lot of talent. But you don't get very much today. So go get you some talent, but not much because you don't have much room in that bag. Simone, you get a little bit more. Simone's got some talent going on. Simone's a new mama. Simone's a new mama. Y'all give her some more. She needs some talent and some time, so she's going to get some of that. And then, Alan, you got all the room in the world, dude. Come get you some talent all over the place. Get some major talent going on because you got lots of talent, lots of talent. Now, I got to ask you something about Stephen here. Why didn't the first servant get more? Like, because it said, what does it say? That in proportion, dividing it in proportion to what? Their abilities, their abilities. We read that and we go, that's not fair. Right? Have you ever read that story and thought, that's not fair? Well, first off, let me tell you, the fair is a place that you go and get elephant ears and ride rides put up very dangerously by carnies. That's what the fair is. All right? And life is not fair at all. But here, here's another thing. Can, can I tell you something? Now listen. This, this is going to be shocking to some of you. God is not fair. All right? God is not fair. And let me, let me just celebrate that for just a minute. Listen to Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you glad God's not fair? I'm, I'm glad God, I'm trusting in his overabundance of not being fair. My faith depends on him not being fair. He has told me the wages of my sin is death, but he's going to give me free, eternal life. He's not fair at all, and God, please don't start being fair to me today. Don't walk around and go, I just wish life were fair. No, you do not wish life was fair. You don't want life to be fair. But... I do think that there's more than just capriciousness going on by God here. It's not like God's just going, well, I mean, you know, I like Alan better than Simone, and I like Simone better than Stephen, so that's just what I'm going to do. No, there's something within the story that shows us something. Why would Stephen, the one with the one bag of talent or coins as it was, 
Why would he just get that one? Well, look at what he does. Look at what he does with it. He didn't use his time wisely. So there's something about the way that we use our time that God is illustrating in this story. Because look at what it says about what he did. What did he do? He buried it away. Listen, the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. He multiplied. So by the end of the story, Alan's got ten bags of silver. The servant with the two bags of silver also went to work, action-oriented, using what they've got, and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money, buried it away. And God is showing us because a parable is a story that comes alongside of a truth in parallel to a truth to illustrate something to us. So God is illustrating something to us through the words of Jesus in this story. He's saying, why would I give more to the one who doesn't even use what I gave them to begin with? Why would I bless? I can't afford to tithe, Pastor. There's no possible way that I can afford to give of my treasure to God. I can't afford to tithe. Can, can I tell you something? You can't afford not to tithe. You can't. If you've been looking at your life going, there's no possible way I can return to God what is already his. I'm just praying God will bless me so that I'll have and be able to tithe. Why would God bless someone who doesn't even obey them to begin with? What are you doing? Well, I just wish that, I, I wish I had more talent. I wish I had more time. I wish my time could be supernaturally used. Well, why would he give you more time that you just buried away playing Xbox at night instead of studying God's word just a little bit? Why would he give you more time that you just invest in yourself all the time? Why, why would he do that? And, and listen, don't think of God as being punishing in that. It's not a punishment. It's a smart investor. Like, if you have three bank accounts, and one of your bank account is doubling your return every single time, another one of your investments is doubling your return every time, and then you've got another investment who is not doing anything. No return on your money at all. You had the same amount when you started 10 years ago. Which one are you going to put more into? I mean, we do believe that God is wise, Right? So he's going to look at our lives and the decisions we make and whether we are under the covering of authority and whether we are under the covering and operating in an anointing and he's going to go, there's a good place to invest. There's a good place to invest. In other words, he was not, the, the, the guy who got one was not willing to risk any of his time or to have any risk of losing something to go out and invest what he had. And so... Some people think when it comes to our talent, so we've got our talents, right? Everybody in here has got a talent. But some people think that talent just falls on people. Have you ever heard, oh, man, I wish I was as talented as them. I wish I just had that talent. And they think it just lands on people. That's very rare. It, it happens every now and then that someone's just extremely talented, five-year-old playing pian concert piano. You see that. And it's savant-like. and That's amazing. But it's, it's very rare. Most people who are great at something work really, really, really hard to be great at it. They take risk. They invest. They get under a coach and say, I want to be a better two-year-old teacher. That They get under somebody and go, I want to I be better at what I do. I want to be better at how I serve God. I love right now watching my daughter Izzy. She's 13 years old. And, and she, I tell her all the time, she's working at becoming talented. That's important because right now she is somewhat talented, but she's not as talented as she can be or will be if she'll continue working. She's working at becoming talented. She's writing songs. She, she's musically involved. She's taking lessons, and she, she's doing all the things to work to become talented. And what I told her the other day, I said, she's 13 years old, and I said, when you're 23 years old, here's what's going to happen, I know it's going to happen, is you're going to be in a position of God using you in an incredible way, but there are going to be people who will go, oh man, I wish I had the talent that Izzy had. 
I, I wish I had the opportunities that Izzy had. If I were the pastor's kid, I bet I would have that opportunity too. I wish I had that opportunity. And I said, what they're going to think is that you are an overnight success that actually was 10 years in the making. And so I've been pouring that into her. But I want to pour it into you. I want to pour it into you. There's no one that you see that is great at something that didn't work at it. And God knew they will invest this talent that I'm giving them. They will invest it. They will pour into it this talent that I'm giving. They, they will pour out of them. They will use it for me. They will multiply it. So, so you will reap what you harvest. Izzy will reap what she is. She will, she will reap what she is sowing. She'll harvest what she's sowing. You will, you will reap what you sow. And if you will sow work and you'll sow belief in God to be able to use you, he can use your talent. So let me just ask you, what's your talent? What has God given you that you're just really good at? Everybody's got something. It's false humility to act like you don't have something. You know what you're good at. What, what are you good at? And how are you sowing it? How are you using it? All right, last bag, last bag. So everybody come, get some treasure. Everybody then gets to come get some treasure. Now, I want you to see something about this. Stephen doesn't have a lot of room left. Doesn't have a lot of room left. Simone has a little bit of little room left. She's got a whole other bag left. She's going to get some treasure. Alan, dude's got bling. He's loaded. He's got plenty of room. He's, he's going to pile up the treasure, pile up the treasure, pile up the treasure. And here's, this is my favorite subject really to talk about. Here's why. The subject excites me the most because I love, listen to me, I love the fact that just like the parable chooses to, to give some resources and others not, that, that, that there's a Guy in the story who gets five bags of silver, somebody who gets two bags of silver, somebody who gets one bag of silver. I love the fact that God chooses to give some more than he gives others. You say, well, that's strange. Why, why do you choose it? I love the fact that sometimes it doesn't even make sense. You go, why in the world? Does that person get that amount of financial resource? How did they get that? How did they land that? I love the fact that if some of you were honest with yourself, you would go, how in the world did I get the job that I have? And how am I making the income that I'm making? How, how did I, do? I, don't, I don't know how that happened. I love the fact that there are some who get a very small amount and some who get a medium amount and some who get a lot. Because what it shows us is that God has empowered us to be able to use what we get. Use what we get. Work what you have. God is saying, listen, it, what does it boil down to? Here's what it boils down to. Trust. It's trust. That God, for some reason, this is the amount of treasure you chose to allow me to have in my life. This is the job. This is the education. This is the skill set. This is how my talent translates into economic gain. And you chose for that to be in 2019 how I can make a living and what that would be paid. And, and, all those, and you just go, God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to trust you because I trust that you can do it. And it sets us up to use what we have. But then it sets us up for something else. It sets us up to need one another. Because here's the thing, if this is the church, all of a sudden, we look at this and we go, well, Stephen just doesn't have enough. What could Stephen do? I mean, well, Simone, Simone's got a little bit more, but even, she, she doesn't have enough. And even Alan, it doesn't have enough to do everything the church needs to do. But look at this. When Stephen brings his and returns his, and when Simone returns hers, and when Alan returns his, all of a sudden, I don't have enough, but we have everything that we need. So I don't have enough time. But we have enough time. I don't have enough time. But we have enough time. I don't have enough treasure. There's no one here that could single-handedly pay for the new expansion. If there is, please see me after the service. <laughs> just, just say it. 
we'll all take one for the team and let you, let you do it. Like we're fine with that. But I don't think there's anyone here that can single-handedly do it. However, when we all, the anointed versions of ourselves, no, and that's the thing, listen, if I come and go, man, this is the church, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep some of mine. I'm going to keep some of my time. This is my time. I'm, I'm going to keep some of my talent. I'm going to keep some of my treasure. Not only have we not obeyed God, we have robbed the church of being able to be all it can be. Because, listen, this is the positive part, because we need you. We need you. you. You are a part of the whole. You're a part of who we are. You're not a consumer. You don't just sit and see. And, and listen to what Malachi 3, 8 and 10 says. It says, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, God says. But you say, how have we robbed you? And God says, in your tithes and in your contributions. I think we can translate that to in our tithes and our contributions of our treasure. That we come and we return what God has given us. That we return our tithes of our talent and our contribution of our time. And that's why. We are a generous church because in order to be the church that God has called us to be, we must be a generous church. For us to be a generous church, you must be a generous people, generous people. So, so I want to ask us, I just want us to do some evaluation. How are you doing at this? Can we be the church that we need to be if you continue as you're participating now? I mean, with your time? Are you really giving your talent? Have you found that place where you can contribute in such a way that it makes a difference in people's lives? How about your treasure? I mean, are, you con are you contributing to the vision that you believe in and say you believe in? Are you allowing someone else to carry that weight? See, together, we are that church. We are that church. God, would you allow this not to sit on us with any guilt whatsoever? God, there is no condemnation and those who are with Christ Jesus. God, don't let the enemy of our soul convince us that somehow this is not for us or about us or that we can't possibly have anything to offer. But instead, God, let us hear the one word that you have for us, which is that you have a place for us. Our time, our talent, our treasure is a piece and part of the whole. God, let us... Let's hear your voice as we respond. Let's go to the cross and repent where we've not given of our time, our talent, and our treasure. So we just repent, God, today. We say, God, we're sorry. And we leave that on the cross and we, we move forward now in repentance and obedience so that we can be anointed. God, let us go to the candle and just maybe light a candle and just symbolically to say, you know what, God, you, you have shown me today how I can be the anointed version of myself that you want me to be. And we're going to go after that. And then we're going to worship. Oh, we're going to worship. God, we love you. We're thankful for you. In Jesus' name, amen.